Previously, on Solve the World. Young lady, what are you talking about? Oh, I was staring at this little squirrel, and I was just wondering what separates mankind from animal... kind. Ah! Sam began to get up. His knees cracked one at a time as he slowly rose. That's one we old folks all know the answer to. Why is that? Sam began to walk away. Young lady, that's an answer you can only learn over time. Solve the World, a fictional adventure told in 100 episodes. How much longer must I toil? Episode 54, Catch and Release. Are you scared? Now, Jennifer wasn't scared. An internal mechanism had engaged, a motor long at rest. Jennifer Dash was playing a game. Life was the centerpiece of the game. But there was no reason to take anything too seriously. When you play games, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Tonight, Jen was going to win. She was. She was quite certain of it. Even if she didn't, though, no biggie. It wasn't in her mind to ponder on the what-ifs of being caught. Currently, Jen lay outstretched, crammed between two bulbous and long tree limbs, about 18 feet up off the ground, long in the back of someone's yard. The orange moon nestled her to sleep peaceably. Those barbarous grocery store men weren't going to find her. Surely, they weren't sniffing anywhere near her. From time to time, she'd hear yells and tire screeches, but these were distant murmurs, rumors of war. She found herself oddly disinterested by the background noise. Jennifer Dash slept dreamlessly. While she slept that night, a storm that had been brewing for some time was striking fearfully and forcefully at the Onmo Center, deep in the heart of the Great White North. Scout had heard rumblings of its coming. Since her arrival at Onmo, Scout had been a part of the welcoming committee. Every. Single. Monday. Caravans of vans, buses, and oddly a few beat-up limousines brought new kids, young bloods, brand spanking new recruits. But for three Mondays in a row now, Mother Foreman let it be known on the intercom that no new children were coming that day. Schedules were good in a place like Onmo. The consistency let one think through the upcoming day's trials. It allowed room for one to think through every potential disaster. For Scout Further, routine which by its monotony was already driving other kids bonkers, was just the sort of thing that could be used to gain leverage. Scout devised that she needed to be an important person in Onmo. Important, but not noticed. Chief among the myriad ways to accomplish this was to make inroads with adults. This proved tricky, as you couldn't do it in front of peeping eyes. If other kids saw you talking peachy with adult, you would be kicked to the side of the road by whatever gang you previously made claim to. Children are merciless. They do, however, balance their mercilessness with forgetfulness, nearsightedness. None of this, though, is consequential to our examination of Onmo today. What's important is that Scout's main dolt, a young woman who went by the name Clementine and would often make sure Scout got the varieties of malandrinian that she most preferred, told Scout a secret. Mother Foreman was in a bad way. Clementine thought maybe she had late-stage multiple sclerosis, MS, something like that. Clementine had had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with her, only to discover that Mother Foreman couldn't see Clem. Literally, she couldn't see her. Mother Foreman was trying to hide a momentary blindness. Or, maybe it wasn't so momentary. Then, 
just a week after Clementine's juicy gossip, Mother Foreman announced that any child who wanted to see her could. This was very strange. There were long lines. Kids had problems. If anyone could solve them, it was the big M, the mother hen, the head of the family. But the meetings didn't go as the children, in their fertile minds, had planned. Mother Foreman heard no complaints, took no notes, made no statements. Rather, she hugged them. Every kid, unknowingly, was waiting in line for a simple hug. One hug, usually quite long, five or six seconds. Then Mother Foreman kissed them on the forehead and brusquely shooed them off, only to repeat the process with the next little complainer. This was odd behavior. And now, tonight, the rooster was home to roost. It was stormy out, past the mandatory bedtime for daytime workers. All children were called to the greenhouse. The greenhouse was the biggest single room at Onmo. It was bigger than the auditorium, and at this late stage, was the only place that could hold every resident captive in one locale. Thunderclouds struck above the dark, stormy night. On a high terrace, a crude wooden conveyor belt built to help workers trim the taller plants and vines, a tall, slender, rugged man glared down at the huddle of innocence. He wore a dark fedora with a matching pinstriped suit, executively trimmed to his outline. Covering his eyes were large, round aviator glasses. So large that Scout could even find herself in their reflection amidst the sea of kidlings. His voice boomed above the thunder. Mother Foreman is gone. I, I am here. I stand where she once did. You shall call me Constable. I am Constable. My words are law. There was silence. A single child began to cry. <laughs> the air was thick with fear. We must read this! From his pocket, Constable unfolded a two-page paper. The words were those of Edgar Allan Poe. Once, upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor," I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember. It was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Jen awoke to sunshine and the morning songs of happy birds, unaware of the world's many sorrows. There were squirrels in her tree, bouncing here and there. Jen assumed, though she never saw with her own eyes, that the scrappy little critters were hiding and harvesting many an acorn somewhere deep in the bowels of the tree. Perhaps she could steal one or two. Acorns were edible, right? Food. Food. Yes. Jen awoke hungry. Not starving, of course. Betty's spaghetti with sausage did do quite an adequate job of filling her up just fine last night, so Jen had no reason to complain. But it was a new day, a new sun, and watching those pernicious little squirrels seesaw about just bubbled fooding thoughts to the surface of Jen's mind. But it seemed unwise to go out of the tree. Travel by day was suspect. If everyone in the world knew about Jennifer Dash, if every smartphone from here to Timbuktu streamed her image, then perhaps it was prudent to only travel at night. The day drained slowly.
very slowly. Staring at the squirrels, an old thought resurfaced for Jennifer Dash. What makes humans different from the animals? The answer, according to an old man long ago, a strolling passerby on the hard knock streets of Los Angeles, had answered that question once upon a time. Sam Dearden had offered the one word answer. Ambition. Ambition separated us from the animals. Did Jen have any ambition left inside of her? Ugh, that was too broad a question. You can't think in grandiose terms, old girl. Think simple. Compartmentalize. Think practically. Did Jen have any ambition specifically for today? Her first thought in response to her own question made Jen laugh out loud. She somewhat nervously had to fan the horizon with her eyes to make sure she didn't provoke any onlookers from afar. It looked clear. No one was out here. Most likely, the former residents of the house in the foreground weren't even home. Anyway, ambition. 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 What ambition did Jen have today? Ambition to find food. Ambition to go to the bathroom. That one, actually, was growing quite urgent. Judging by the position of the sun, it was maybe noon, quite possibly 1 or 1.30. Here's the deal, old girl. Wait until dark. Then, sneak into the house, raid the pantry, use the bathroom. Spend a day or two in the shelter. Come up with a game plan. Find your true ambition. Nope, that won't work. You can't wait until nightfall to go to the bathroom, old girl. What is that, six hours? That's one long, boring, miserable wait. Jen contemplated her options. Back on Pishtaco's island, she'd grown accustomed to defecating in a tiny pit just beside the tiny pit that she and three other people lived in. Maybe she could just man up and do her business right here in the tree. Ew. Maybe not. Now, the fact of the matter was, no one was living in the house. If someone was in there, they were being awfully quiet. In the daytime, with the sun shining, Jen could check out the house, go room by room, make sure no one's sleeping in the closet or something creepy like that. If she went at night, it'd just be too freaky to search the old haunt. Plus, she couldn't turn on any lights, in fear of attracting attention from the neighbors. If she was going to go into the house, she was going to do it during the day. Ambition. That's what separates us from the animals, Jen thought. She climbed down the tree and sauntered over to the presumably empty house. One last memory popped into Jennifer Dash's head before she snuck through the back door of the one-story ranch-style house. The most salient words of passerby Sam Dearden. Because whatever we are, we become more of that over time. Because whatever we are, we become more of that over time inside the house. No sounds, no TV in the background, no footsteps, no snoring, no nothing. Jen tiptoed around, but it didn't take very long to feel comfortable. No one was here. There was a certain musk, a certain staleness to the house. It was the scent of non-movement, of time passed without activity. It was the clear sign of a house that may have a long memory, But it didn't hide any secrets. Not today. No one was going to come home from work that evening. The house was abandoned. After using the bathroom, Jen scavenged the fridge and freezer. There wasn't much there that looked appetizing. There were a lot of Tupperware filled with moldy leftovers. Thankfully, Rocky Road ice cream beckoned her in the freezer. It was in one of those gallon tubs, the same kind Jen used the night prior to knock down that one dude. Two days in a row now. Ice cream was Jen's savior. She found a bowl in the cupboard, a spoon, and plopped herself with bowl filled to the brim down on a couch facing a big widescreen TV. This couch, unlike the sad furthers, had all its stuffing in the right place. Jen made herself at home. She found the TV remote, turned the TV on, and watched smugly stare at her. Though it should have been creepy and haunting, it was anything but. The silent fox comforted Jen. A quiet, if not strange, friend. A couple hours later, banging on the door. Open up! 
keys in the door. Open. Jen knew she should run. But she froze, not knowing where to go, where to hide. A beer-bellied man, darker-skinned, probably Mexican by heritage, paced into the family room, gun firmly pointed at Jen. His cowboy hat and terse demeanor proved he meant business. You're gonna have to come with me, little lady. Jen didn't move. Should she comply? Or make a run for it? Was he one of the ones from last night? Didn't look like it. All the men last night were white boys. This man was certifiably brown. If he was with the groused out group from last night, then Jen could bet that his shooting skills were subpar. But it seemed unlikely. He didn't act like those guys. He was doing this methodically. Where, where, where are we going? Jen tried to say lackadaisically. In the back of my car, for starters. Jen had been in the trunk of a limousine before. It wasn't the most fun she'd ever had. What if I say no? Then I shoot you. Probably in the gut. You won't die, but you'll wish you had. And while you're slowly bleeding out, I'll put you in the backseat of the car anyway. Backseat? He said backseat, not trunk. Okay, that's a good sign. Stand up, put your hands behind your head, and walk slowly in front of me. If you try to run or do anything else stupid, I'll shoot you. Jen got up, followed instructions. She felt the end of the gun poke the small of her back as she walked. This was not good. Jen exhaled as they walked through the front door. The car. It was a police car. You're a cop, Jen couldn't help but say. I'm the constable of this bear town. Constable. Constable. Constable, Jen muttered. Yeah, pretty much a cop. But constable is the preferred nomenclature. He did that thing where he pressed the back of Jen's head down as she got in the back seat. They drove, slowly. The constable kept looking back at Jen in his rear view. He pulled to the side of the road quite suddenly. You're Jennifer Dash. Um. Yeah, Jen answered. No point in lying. Apparently placated, the constable started driving again. How'd you find me? The house you were burglar in had an alarm. I didn't hear an alarm. It wasn't that tight. It let us know there was an intruder. They didn't go very far. They pulled into the driveway of a nice two-story residence. Why are we stopping? Jen asked. It's the end of the world, toots. Think I'd take you to the police academy? Stay in the car. The constable went into the house. Jen, of course, tried to open the door, but it remained inevitably locked. Before she could scheme up some sort of escape plan, the constable returned with handcuffs. He cuffed Jen to himself as she exited the vehicle. Jen found this odd. Disturbing, even. She would have liked it better had he just cuffed her hands behind her back. They walked into the house. It seemed like a random house. There were photos on the walls. Pictures of a happy family. And it wasn't the constable's family. They took a hard right turn past the dining room. The constable opened a door. Stairs leading downward. We don't have a sufficient jailhouse right now. The old one, well, it's not up to code anymore. You could say, so... You'll have to stay down here for now. The basement? Jen said, scared. He flicked the lights on as they marched downwards. At the bottom, apparently left in the dark, cuffed to a pipe was a woman. She squinted up at the two. Jen froze. She recognized her instantly. She looked more homely, looked maybe more drug-addled than before, skinnier too. But there was no denying that face. Jennifer Dash, meet Dolores Burden. 
I'm sure you two will get along just fine. Jen couldn't move. Come on now. The constable pushed Jen with his gun ever so slightly. She still didn't budge. Don't worry. The doll here wouldn't hurt a fly. Pushed again, this time forcefully. There might be a bruise tomorrow from it. Jen, like a straddled horse, begrudgingly gave in. The constable uncuffed himself and chained it to the pipe just beside Dolores. I'd leave the TV on for you, but the only channel we get these days is smuggly. Where, where, where are you going? Jen asked desperately. Better to be with the cop than alone with Dahl. Just gotta make a couple calls. Gotta figure out what to do with you. I was out all last night looking for a teenage girl. Burglarized the local grocer. Beat in a guy's face pretty good. I'd have them boys come take a look at you. And he left. Dolores and Jen sat on the hard, cold ground of who knows where's basement. Dahl's big eyes stared at Jen. Jen shivered. She didn't know what to say. You look like my daughter. She was missing all her front teeth. That was different. Maybe... Maybe she didn't remember Jen? My... My... My daughter... Was... Taken from me. Jen thought it better not to say anything. She's at... Onmo now. That's where the Piper took her. He's a thousand years old. He knows how to take children. That was... Almost smart. Dahl had heard about the Onmo Center, the presidential Operation No More Orphans, a survival safe haven for parentless children. Dahl had heard the reports and melded them with her own story, mixed it in with the Pied Piper fable. It was almost cute. Jen remained vigilant, kept silent. She feared that her voice might trigger something in Dahl. She didn't want the crazy truck driver remembering that Jen flopped out of her big rig at top speed. The minutes went by slowly. Jen had thought, whilst back in the tree this morning with the birds and the acorn-stuffing squirrels, that those minutes were agonizing. Looking at it now, that was simply untrue. Oh, to be back in the tree. The tree was safe. The tree was calm. Look at where all this ambition got Jen. Cup next to Doll Burden, who probably ranks right under the numbered man and the minotaur of people she'd like to never hang out with again. Ambition. Jen's ambition was clear now. Get away from here. Get away from this weird copper, away from Doll, away from weird broken Louisiana. Atticus was with Smuggler. Maybe the whole TV thing is to weed out certain people. If it's creepy and scary to you, then you're the type of person Smuggly doesn't want. Smugly wants hardened souls, fearless people. Folks like Atticus Further. Maybe folks like Jennifer Dash. Ultimately, Jen wanted to make sure Scout was safe. Jen wanted to get to Anmo, but how? Jen didn't even know where to start. At least, back when she wanted to find Leviathan, the sea monster wasn't specifically made to be hidden. And even though Jen didn't know where he was, the ocean was at least a starting place. Anmo was a place meant not to be found. Jen needed help finding it. She needed help finding it with a person who would be just as committed as Jen could be. She needed Atticus. Here's ambition for you. Jennifer Dash would go to Smugly, find Atticus, convince him to search for Anma with her, save Scout. The end. <laughs> These flights of fancy distracted Jen from Dahl's horrid scent, as well as the multiple boots marching down the basement stairs. Four men. Three, in full police apparel, stared down at Jen. They wore the uniforms, but they weren't conducting themselves like trained officials. Their gear was disheveled, shirts half untucked, slouching and slobbering as they gawked over the incarcerated teenager. She's cute, said one mustached officer. Hi, ain't you a pretty thing, said another. The third took out his phone, snapped a picture of Jen. The other two followed suit. Then all three of them took a selfie, grinning gleefully at the camera while Jen turned aside. The constable came straddling down a moment later. What you think, fellas? She's the real deal, all right, said the mustache. We could sell her, make a fortune, said the non-uniformed stranger. The third, this man bent down, brought his face right up next to Jen's. Dahl looked on wide-eyed, either in wonder or terror. What you doing, Jeremy? said the constable. Can I kiss her? The creep said just above a whisper. The constable grabbed Mr. Creepster by the haunches, tossing him back. Get out of her face. 
I didn't bring you down here to make googly eyes at a minor. She's not a minor. 18 years old? Perfectly legal. Everything's legal now, if we say so, the creep sneered. Okay, Constable said, his hand stroking his chin in contemplation. If we sold her, who do we sell her to, and how much do we get in return? Whoever offers the most! Can't do that. At least the constable seemed to have a reasonableness in his voice. If we let everyone know she's here, all of a sudden this town be swarming with wolves. That's a no-go. We'll hide her, Jeremy. I said no. Jeremy. What a creepster name. We got one shot at this. Who do we call? The government. They're the only ones we could trust to pay up. Maybe. But they won't pay much, if anything. The gov needs an angel like her. Sweet things showboat around? Yeah, but that's true of everyone. I heard that the Anconias are pretty active these days. Working through ghost channels out west and in South America? I bet they'd pay. That's not bad. Who else? Four men kept spitballing. Jennifer Dash was being sold into slavery. How about smugly? Nah, they won't pay nothing. What if we make a fake story? You know, call some of these folks up, offer them something else. Say we found some missiles or something. That's not bad. Just to see what sort of offers generally are on the table? Yeah, but Jennifer Dash is better than a weapons cache. Heck, there's nothing that compares to her in the whole wide world right now. She's the most bona fide commodity we could ever hope to get our hands on. Still, I think we have to do our due diligence. The contrast of rewards might be... <sighs> the punk made a smacking noise with his lips. Okay, go. Figure something out. Let's meet back in... in... He looked at his watch. Say two hours. That enough time? The others nodded in approval. Okay. She'll be okay alone here, Jeremy the Creep said whilst licking his lips. I could keep her company while you fine gentlemen get some work done. The constable took his cowboy hat off his head and, with his other hand, open face slapped the degenerate. You will not sneak back down here. You understand me? You will not. You will not damage the goods. Yes, sir, Jeremy said with his tail between his legs. The men walked up and out of the basement. Constable flicked the lights off as he closed the door behind him. Pitch blackness. There, in those dark depths, Dolores Burden began to cry aloud. A sad, bitter cry. Jen, not able to endure both the unfathomable blackness and this infernal weeping, broke her promise to herself not to speak up. Hey, what's wrong? She asked Doll. <laughs> no, no one wants me. The sad woman bellowed. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from up my door. Quoth the raven nevermore, and the raven never flitting still is sitting still is sitting on the pallid bust of palace just above my chamber door and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor and my soul from out the shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted Nevermore! All of us are haunted by the past, by our parents we left behind. You and I and everyone here is one. That's why, despite what you might think, the changes that I am installing 
here at Anmo, beginning tonight! Our four are good! You're good! There is a raven, and that raven, that eternal fear and anguish, this is what will lead us to victory! Be afraid, children! But use your fear to stay alive. The new foreman, known coincidentally as Constable, began to list out the new rules of Onmo Nation. Jeremy, the non-uniformed pervert from earlier, flicked on a light and paced quickly down the basement stairs. Jen slumped her head. She could figure what he was coming to do. He was breaking orders, breaking rank. People only ever did such a thing to exercise their most venal of potentials. In his hand, a saw. Don't move, he barked. He began to saw the chain of the handcuffs off the drain. It didn't take long. As soon as it was done, Jeremy grabbed Jen by the wrist, dragging her up and out of that dank room. She gave in like a rag doll in the arms of an overzealous infant. He pulled her with Herculean force up the stairs. As they exited, Jen heard Dolores' sad whisper. Goodbye, sweet daughter. Guys, this is Dante. I need you to do something for me. If you can, do it right now. I'll owe you one. <laughs> Go to DanteStack.com, D-A-N-T-E-S-T-A-C-K, my website, and on the website you should see an announcement bar just right at the top of the screen. If you don't see it, though, under the headline More, at the top of the screen you'll see a tab called Audience Survey. Click on it. It's 14 questions. Please, please, please fill out this audience survey for me. So the reason we're doing a survey right now is because I need to convince potential sponsors that the demographics of the people that listen to this program, A, really, really like the show, and B, are the coolest people in the world and will totally buy your product. So I could use the help of your voice telling potential sponsors, telling potential investors into the show that, hey, I'm a real person and I like Dante's programs. So if you do that for me right now, I'd really be appreciative of it. Thanks. By the way, this show, as always, is produced by me, Dante Stack, if you didn't already figure that out, and all attribution for the music and sound effects used in this episode and every episode can be found on our show notes page, also at DanteStack.com. Okay, guys, survey. It's just 14 questions. Do it. Do it. Do it. Also, while you're on the website, tip jar. Tip jar. Tip jar. See you next week.